Welcome to a very special episode of Chew the Fat. In today's episode, I sit down with a guest called Matt Weston, who tells a heartbreaking story about his four-year-old who was diagnosed with leukemia on Christmas Eve. Part of the Eat With Purpose cookbook is around raising money for charity, and today's guest is around me finding the right charity and the right place that we can make an impact. I hope you enjoy. Matt Weston, Children's Cancer Institute Ambassador. Welcome to Chew the Fat. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. Today's going to be a really tough one. Um, and ultimately, the goal here for me is I, I want to share your story. You know, you and I sat down at a cafe and hearing, even in a room filled with people, hearing your story, it touched me in a place, for me, not even going through the experience, but just hearing it from you and, and being you know, a recent dad. There's something about that that just hit me. And I, I, I want to make sure we share it. So I guess where I want to start today is like, Give me the context as to, to why you know you are you know fighting the cause you're fighting with children's cancer. Sure. Okay. This is a it's a long backstory. So um, yeah, well, as, as we discussed before, you know it was the lead up to Christmas 2021, two years of COVID, really strange time for for everyone on on the planet. I think and and. You know, we'd been separated from family and stuff. It'd been a really challenging time and we were just sort of limping our way towards the Christmas holidays, looking forward to a break as a family. The borders were about to open, so we were going to be able to see, um, you know, to see our, my parents and everything again. Um, and we booked extra time off. So, you know, it was all like really quite an exciting time um, and looking forward to Jacob. My eldest boy was about to go into school the next year and just completely out of the blue um, one night. So it would have been the 21st of December, I think, like a Tuesday. Obviously, I can remember it very clearly. Um, Jacob woke up in the middle of the night screaming in pain. Um, and it's one of those moments I look back on and, you know, at the time just had no idea what the hell was going on. There's no warning signs of anything whatsoever. He'd seemed, even that day, you know, completely healthy. We'd been at a friend's house playing in their swimming pool, having a great day. Um, and essentially this started a journey for us of um, hospital appointments, doctor's appointments over a few days, um, where eventually on Christmas Eve, I had to take Jacob back to the hospital again because he looked so ill. Um, Christmas Day, transferred to Westmead, and, and a few days later, he was diagnosed with leukemia. So that's the sort of short version of, of that week, but it was, um, as you can imagine, life just went from normal, happy, to just completely changing in, in an instant. And, and, and bring me back to that moment on the 21st. How, how old was Jacob at the time? Um, Jacob was four. Four years um, old. Yeah, so he was literally four years old, turning five in the February, mm -hmm. and was literally um, going into his, about to go into his kinder year um, and, at school. And you mentioned he was, he was crying and screaming. Like, did, did that feel and sound different to normal? It were, oh, like, honestly, it's, it's hard to articulate just how intense it was. You know, initially, I was actually working up, I work from home, I do calls in the evening to the UK, and I was working sort of upstairs. So I hear this scream, and I think he's had a nightmare or something initially, and that he shares a room with our little one, so I, I kind of run downstairs. But when I got in there, you could just see something was not right. Um, and the only way I can maybe sort of describe, like imagine someone's been shot, right? That kind of intense pain, like writhing, sort of lifting his back mm. off the bed, screaming like at the top of his lungs. And he just didn't stop. It was relentless. And he was just like that. I can't even tell you how long it was. And we were just, we had no idea what to do. We're calling an ambulance. Ambulance can get there for a while. Um, and then it ended up my wife taking him up to um, the Northern Beaches Hospital. And I think, you know, it was eventually it just sort of to ease off. But it would have been hours of him in this real intense pain 
which was so intense he couldn't actually really tell you where it was because mm. he was in that much pain. Um, yeah, it, it, honestly, thinking back to it, it was just shocking, absolutely shocking. And what did that feel like? Honestly, the, the, the feeling was just like complete, I felt useless <laughs> like to, uh, at the time when I think back now, when I'm, <clears throat> you know, some of the silly things that went through my head, you know, thinking, it sounds stupid now, but oh God, is, is, is he like, because he kept complaining about his stomach at one point. I'm like, oh, he maybe I've not noticed he's not been to the toilet for days and he's like in incredible pain from that or something, you know, really stupid things. Um, but there was nothing I, I could do to, to ease it for him. And so it was just like, as a parent, just, I just felt completely useless. I didn't know what was going on. You know, I couldn't solve the problem. And he, there's my son just in the most unbelievable amount of pain. Um, yeah, and, and like I say, even thinking back to it now, it's, you know, that was the thing that kicked everything off. Mm. And, it's, and it's still one of those moments that's just, you know, it's just imprinted on, on my mind forever because it was that intense. I, I, I truly actually can't imagine or fathom what that would feel like. And take me to that moment where you, you, you sat down and, and I guess each day builds and, and you're, you're getting these tests and you're going back to Westmead. What was that moment like when you sat down and got that diagnosis? Oh, so, get, so when, we, <clears throat> excuse me, when we got to Westmead on Christmas Day, you can imagine, right? We wake up Christmas morning, mm -hmm. we knew what was, we've got to go to Westmead. Um, Christmas Day is meant to be like the best time of year mm. for kids. And it was just like, so we just felt so empty and, <clears throat> you know, it was tense and we're trying to like open a few presents and whatnot. And, and then me and Jacob had to head off, um, head off to the hospital and, and we get there and it's just dead. Like no mm. one's at the hospital. Mm. <clears throat> There's hardly any staff, hardly any people there, as you can imagine on Christmas Day. But in my mind, I'm there thinking <clears throat> they'll, there's something going wrong. Mm. They'll work it out. It's going to be some medicine, mm. a few weeks recovery, and then we're, we're back to normal. Um, so they, they basically, you know how it is, they start a process of, of elimination. His bloods are showing all these strange things. Um, and they actually thought, because of like the bloods are showing like these markers for inflammation, um, the pain was seemingly joint pain. Mm. They thought it was a, a possibly a bone infection, which is still fairly serious. Mm. But so we ended up in the orthopedic ward. So again, when you think about mm. what you, my mind is just not going anywhere near how serious this end up, ended up being, right? So we're spending a few days in there, <clears throat> a few other tests going on. <clears throat> excuse me, and they um, they we're basically saying, look, we need to do a bone scan to confirm this either way. And it's quite a specialist's um, process. And I still remember this so clearly because the person who, uh, the specialist was on holiday and she came back in from holiday to do this. And she turns out heavily pregnant as well. Uh -huh. So I'm like, you know, little things like that really stuck with me that there's this person on holiday, heavily pregnant and she comes back in to, mm. to do this scan. And again, these are those moments where I can just be transported straight back there. I can remember sitting in this room and it was just stinkingly hot. And at the time, and we'll, we'll touch on this in a moment, but I was quite under the weather as well. Um, and it just felt like my head was in like a clamp, mm. just feeling horrendous. And even at that point, I'm not thinking anything. And I can remember a few questions being asked by the person doing the scan. Um, took quite a while and then we went back to the wards and we just sat in the ward. It was interesting because in this ward you've got these few families who are there over Christmas and there's a bit of camaraderie between mm. you because it's a pretty rubbish thing to all be in there over Christmas and we formed a bit of a bond and we're chatting and whatnot and uh, a bit later on the doctors came into the room and they're like, um, Mr Weston, do you mind coming with us? We'd like to have a conversation with you. I can just remember it was like the atmosphere just felt different mm. um, and so they took me away from from Jacob and 
it was, I could just tell there's something not mm. right here. And they'd said to me before the bone scan, they were like, look, we just need to lay out all the things it could be. We still think it's a bone infection, but here's some other things it could be. And cancer had been mentioned, but they're like 1% chance. Mm. Like we, we don't believe it's that, but we have to tell you mm. because, you know, part of protocol, etc. Um, and then they were like, look, I know we said that it was 1% chance, um, but now we're 99% sure this is this cancer and, and most likely leukemia. And it's like, it is literally like the, just the world stopped. Like, I, uh, it's hard to describe how it felt. It was just like my legs were sort of, I was struggling to balance. I couldn't really hear anything that was going on and I sort of just got lost in my head. Um, and I can just remember sort of questioning reality. Mm. You know, those moments where you're like, this, this, this can't be happening. This, this, you know, this isn't real. Um, obviously just completely emotional, you know, crying, upset and my only experience or knowledge of leukemia before this was um, a kid at my school. He was like three, four years above me at school. Um, and tragically, he'd passed away. Mm. So you can imagine, like, that's my, my only point of reference is mm. that. So in that moment, I think I'm losing my son. And it's hard to like put into words what that is like. Mm. Um, it was just earth shattering. And then I can just remember thinking about my wife, you know, it's, it was during COVID at this point. Um, we obviously have no family over here. So she's at home with our, uh, at the time he was only one, wow. Joshua. And I'm relaying all the messages to her. And, and that sort of made me snap out of mm. this thought process. Um, I was like, I've got to call, I've got to call Danny. Like I can't, you know, I, I can't hold on to this information anymore. She needs to know. And I remember I probably should have taken a bit more time to compose myself. <clears throat> and I, you know, I sort of rang the phone. Um, and obviously she's just sat there waiting. So she picks up straight away and it was just like, I wasn't, hadn't composed myself. She picks up straight away and I just fell to pieces. You know, how do you relay to your wife that your firstborn, you know, child has, has cancer? And I just completely broke, like everything just came out and the doctor had to take the phone from me and, and obviously um, broke the news to, to Danny. And then I hear her break down as well. and. You know, it's just, again, one of those moments is just hard to put into words mm, how mm. awful that is. And again, this, this, when I think back to this, it feels like so much time as I'm thinking through all these things mm. and these conversations. It might have only been a couple of minutes, yeah. right? Yeah. But it's like people talk about your whole life flashing before your eyes. I can understand it now because it's like everything, the thought process that was going through my head. Um, and then I can remember just in my, going back in my head again, thinking I need to ask this question, but I wasn't sure I wanted the answer. Mm. And that, that question was what are his chances? Um, I eventually managed to sort of <laughs> somehow get the words out. And, and, and this is where it felt like things changed a little bit for me because the answer was like, look, we, we save 80 plus percent of kids wow. first time round wow. and 90% of kids overall now. And so in this space of time that felt like forever, but was maybe only two minutes, I'd gone from thinking I was going to lose Jacob mm. to then thinking we're going to get through this. And yeah. it became, then it became more about, okay, what's next? Mm. Um, and then from there, obviously, that's when you sort of get into the 
treatment and what's coming and you know it all happens pretty quickly of course so 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 the, the first thing that i noticed as we talked through that is it, it truly does i can see it transports you back in that moment in time and i can see obviously and very clearly that it's 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 been imprinted into your mind and so my question for you is like have you fundamentally changed as a person from the day before the 21st to who you are today or even who you were post that moment um, it's an interesting question because it's like, it's, it's absolutely changed, changed my perspective on everything. And I think maybe it's brought out things in me that were there, but I've pushed them to the front of mm -hmm. what's, um, what's important now. Um, like what's that? So I think, you know, if I look back to before, like I've always had this inbuilt thing of like wanting to help people, wanting mm. to do good, but maybe I wasn't aligned to any particular cause sure. or a purpose. Well, I don't have that problem anymore. Mm. Like I've got so much purpose, um, you know, through this now. Um, and if I look back as well, I was probably lacking, you know, you sort of working and you get to an age, you know, where you're not playing sport anymore. and you sort of lose a bit of sense of community that you had mm. from different things, working from home, yeah. you know, that, that goes. So I was probably lacking sort of um, community as well. And then suddenly I've aligned with all these different groups and I've kind of combined this at the forefront of my life now is the importance of purpose and community, which I didn't have before. So, um, you know, pushing to raise awareness, raise money, um, do whatever I can to support organisations like the, um, the Children's Cancer Institute. Um, and I think just the perspective on life, like nothing seems as, in, I don't want to say nothing seems as important anymore, but I don't get worked up about things that I probably used to get mm. worked up about, right? It's like you can't go through something like this, witness some of the things I've witnessed over the last, um, you know, 18 plus months and then sort of get worried about what seem like trivial things. And in a way, it's, I, I feel like it's become a bit of a superpower because say for instance, in like work, I love my job um, and I'm still incredibly driven, mm -hmm. but I don't get as emotionally attached to things as I used to. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually makes me more, more productive yeah, in my role yeah. because you can look at things very objectively um, and where people are thinking like, you know, this is, this is an emergency or this is all mm. going wrong. I'm like, in the grand scheme of things, no, it's not. Yeah. Let's take a breath and, and, you know, talk things out and, and work our way through. So yeah, just perspective has is, is completely changed. And, and I actually feel like my life, I obviously wish I'd never, we'd never gone through this, but mm. I feel like my life's more complete coming out the other side because I have these other things outside of just work. Wow. Um, that I feel add a lot of value to, to my life and make me happier. And maybe I'm a lot more grateful for things that I didn't used to be grateful for as well. And not so, maybe, definitely. Yeah. yeah. It's, the, the two things that stood out to me when we first met, number one is the perspective, like you've just touched on there, right? Like the perspective shift that you've clearly had from going through this and how that just shapes everything post that. But the thing that stood out to me the most was as we had the conversation and as I hear you talk is I feel you're, you're grounded in the sense of positivity. So even as you said there, you know, this, the diagnosis happened, but as soon as I heard the number, okay, what's next in the step? Yeah. And I think that's an incredible strength and, and it may not be something that you've had to work on, it might just be like who you are and your nature. And yeah. I, th I think that's, you know, it's a truly admirable. And I guess the question I have for you is, how were those dynamics in your family? Did you, did you have to be the rock? Did you have to be the rock around? Or, or how did that work to get you through yeah. the, the really tough time? Yeah, it's interesting really, because it wasn't, <clears throat> it wasn't like a deliberate ploy of mine when you talk about that, but I found myself going, you know, weren't we lucky that it was this Christmas rather than last Christmas because the borders opened just after Christmas and my parents were able to get out really quickly to provide a support, you know, weren't we lucky to be, you know, we got, I think because of the timing over Christmas, we got the, um, 
the sort of head of oncology at Westmead took responsibility mm -hmm. for us, just the greatest man on the planet, the Dr. Luciano Dalla Poza, Luch, as he, as he likes to be referred to, one of the, probably the best doctors in the world for this, wow. and one of the nicest guys ever, and, and so, feel so fortunate that he is the person who's taken responsibility for us. Weren't we fortunate with the diagnosis? Um, you know, you spend a bit of time in a cancer ward and you realize when you've got a leukemia diagnosis, you're maybe the envy of some families. Um, and, and then when you talk about perspective, that was a perspective I got quite quickly when I began to get to meet some of the other families. And, you know, there's people there who they had a cancer that's incurable um, or they, the treatment hadn't worked and they're now into those kind of last options. Um, so it was in everything I, I kind of was looking at, like, weren't we lucky, et cetera. Um, and like, my wife is one of the strongest people you ever meet, right? She's mentally strong, um, you know, a gun in her career, just, you know, all round amazing, um, amazing person. And, you know, she, she definitely found it tougher than me. Like that wasn't her thought process. Um, and so I think there was, you know, there was a, I can remember at the time, there felt like this sort of, almost like a primal instinct, mm -hmm. right, of protector of the family. I could see my wife struggling um, and just being like, I need to make sure that I get my, I get my family through this. Mm. And where I could see that she was struggling at times more with things, I was able to to maybe deal with things a little bit better. And that, that, again, it's, she's the strongest person, like honestly, mm. but it's just, I think as a mother, as fathers will never understand what it's like mm. to carry a child yeah. and that bond that they have. Um, and so it, again, you just, as a, as a family and as a, you know, as a couple, you just, when one sort of down, you, you try and pick them up and, and vice versa, and, and at times she's got me through things, and and, and um, you know we've supported each other um, in that way. But as I say, it was I, I just remember thinking I've I've got to get my um, I've got to get my family through this, and also you know I found after a while at the start I couldn't even say the word cancer or leukemia. Mm -hmm. It was really bizarre. Like I just you know I would like. I couldn't get the words out, and then I so I would communicate with people over messages, origin, wow. and it, you know I could type it out, and then I started to talk to people and let them know. So obviously we've got a big network mm. and loads of pe loads of friends over here, family and friends back home as well, and because Danny, um, you know, she wasn't at a place where she could talk about it, mm. so I almost became like the spokesperson for mm. the family. Mm. So I would call people, I would message people, I'd let people know what was going on. And do you know what? The more I did it, the more it helped. Yeah. Um, and it, that became a thing that helped me get through. And um, it would help me kind of get things off my chest, think through things. Um, and then I've kind of carried on with that. So that mm. then became, you know, like things like this and with the Children's Cancer Institute, it, it's gone outside of the family and friends and it's gone to, trying to raise awareness more wide, you know, mm. widely, um, which, you know, I think is incredibly important to do, considering, you know, I had no idea about this world before, oh, now oh. I do, I think it's, you know, I have a responsibility to, to do whatever I can. Amazing, and, and we're, we're gonna definitely unpack that shortly. I, I have a question around Jacob. Yep. Like, how was he when he heard, like, you know, at such a young age for, the, you're only just starting to be able to use your words and you're only, yeah. you know, the world doesn't yet make sense. Like, what was it like for him through that process? Yeah, it's um, obviously they're at an age, almost thank God, you know, that they have no concept of, mm -hmm. of what's going on. Um, and so to a certain extent, it's almost like they're just kind of against their will. It's like, this is your life now. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's amazing how resilient kids are. Mm -hmm. And you can just imagine, right, here's this little boy 
so excited before Christmas um, and then next thing he's in the hospital and, and like when I said to you like the treatment starts right like the minute after the the bone scan they're like right we need to confirm you know actually confirm this we need to do a bone marrow biopsy but at this point like they know it's cancer mm. so they're like when we do the bone marrow biopsy they put a permanent port into like into his chest which will be for chemo and taking blood and all these things they do lumbar puncture so they test the spinal fluid for cancer cells but at the same time they then pump um, chemo drugs into into the spinal fluid as well Um, blood transfusion I'll touch on that in a moment but so like it was just like from naught to a hundred all of this stuff Um, within days literally same day pretty much so the bone scan happened they're like tomorrow morning this is what's happening um and so you sat there thinking how the hell do i explain this to like a four-year-old and i mean i'm completely traumatized Mm. and i'm trying to sort of and i can just remember talking to him and i was like he loved like marvel and stuff Mm. so i'm trying to go like right you know, there's, you know, with Marvel, there's the baddies, like this person, and then there's the goodies, you know, there's Captain America, there's this, there's that. Well, we're in a situation now where there's some baddies, and the doctors are the, you know, the good guys, mm. and they're the superheroes, and they've got to help us through this, but there's going to be some stuff we, we need to do. And just sort of trying to think of any way you can communicate with a four-year-old. And, and obviously, he just fought back on everything mm. um, at the start particularly like medication. Mm. Medication was a nightmare. Um, and that's, that's one thing. It's funny because I think back to that, some of the most stressful thing, mm. and of course all of it was stressful, but one of the most stressful things was trying to get the amount of medication they have to take into them. So alongside the chemo, there's, he's on steroids, he's on blood pressure medicine, he's on um, antibiotics, you name it. He's four years old barely taking Panadol mm. and you know what kids are like when you have to get them on the Panadol they're like you know they're fighting back so sorry I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent no. here but we'd been as I touched on before and I said about I was feeling rough same day we got the um, leukemia diagnosis we both tested positive for COVID and this is at a time where COVID was really yeah. like yeah. especially in a cancer ward yeah. in a hospital so we had just moved to an isolation suite. Mm. So then, You'd become you know, I'm there. like, I can touch the walls, right? I've got yeah. a big arm span, but <laughs> yeah. still, I can sort of touch the walls in all directions. Um, we're wholly reliant on the hospital now. Can't leave the room. Can't make a cup of, you know, walk the corridors and make a cup of tea. Can't even go down and collect our food. So we're having to like... And you can't see your son. So I'm in with Jacob because okay, he okay. had he got it as well. Oh. So you can imagine that was a panic because oh, no. it's like he's having this treatment. Yeah, yeah. What does COVID mean on top of this? So we're just trapped in this room together. And I mean, the nurses and everything are amazing, right? They're just amazing. But they're having to come in every time they come in fully gowned up. So there's this whole process to go through. It's like outbreak or something, honestly, like oh. just the, the way they're having to treat it but they'll bring in a medication and so at the start it's liquid medications because obviously he's four years old and some of them are disgusting Mm. like steroids right disgusting and they say like from a psychological point of view this is one of the things the kids can push back on Mm. so all the other stuff it's like against their will Mm. and you know at times of having to like hold him and they're doing stuff to him or he's going under general anaesthetic. So he's asleep, he wakes up and the stuff's been done to him. This is like, he can, he can do this. Yeah. And he did it a lot. And there'd be days where there might be, you know, say 12 plus doses of medication, you know, three doses of steroids, couple of bathrooms, this, that, the other. So it might take hours to get one into him, right? Cause we can't afford for him to spit it out, to do anything like this. So I'm locked in this room with him and it might take hours to get one into him. Well, if we're doing 12, 13, 14 a day, they're bringing them in and they're lining them up. And honestly, the feeling of looking and then there's like two or three lined up and I've just spent two, three hours trying to get this one medication into him. And 
I can remember at one point just going to them, like all I was doing, you, know, you can imagine, right? You've, been, you've gone through hell. Mm. You just wanna, I just wanted to lie there with him and just mm. be like, mate, everything's gonna be okay. But I've gotta get this medication into him, like the stakes are too high. Mm. And I can remember a point after a few days where I was like, this is too much. Like, and I said to the nurse, like, I really need your help here. I'm just having to fight him all, all day from waking up to going to bed. We just fight over medication all day. Um, and this was an ongoing process for a very long time. And then there just came a point weeks later, like it got a little bit easier, then it would get harder, then it would get, and then I can't remember how long it was. It might've been four weeks. It might've been six weeks. We taught him to teach, sorry, we taught him to take tablets oh, wow. at like four years old. Wow. And honestly, I can remember we were at home, my mum and dad are over and he starts taking these tablets and he gets it, he's getting them down. We were crying, oh. like all of us were like crying because it just, all we were doing all day long, even my mum and dad are involved now oh. trying to get him in. And it was just like that one thing just took away that constant battle and would allow us then to actually sit and mm. spend time yeah. together and be more caring and, and all of those things. So again, it's probably a weird thing that people don't hear about because yeah. there's all this other stuff going on. But that first, whatever it was, four to eight weeks of just the, the battle of medication was, I look back on and go, I, at some points I don't know, locked in that room, how the hell we got through the day. It was just intense, really intense. Um, and, and that's a perfect example of that perspective shift, right? Yeah. Something that is so small to, you know, uh, but clearly it was a, an amazing reward of a moment mm. that he can have medication and so he could spend that time. Yeah, uh, it, it, was, it literally was game changing from that moment onwards. And now, honestly, he can literally put like two or three tablets in at a <laughs> time and just guzzle them down. It's like, he's got quite a talent for it now, but you know, it took a little bit of time to, to get there. And again, this is, these are the things where I talk about being desensitized to things. Like mad that you know a four-year-old is like guzzling down tablets all day, every day, like in, in any other circumstance. That's just so bizarre. Mm. Um, and I so say even at six, still like you know we were still on chemo meds and everything, and he just like moves on. Mm. Um, it's it's, it's not normal, <laughs> yeah. but it becomes quite normal. Of course. And and what is the relationship like with Jacob? You know now. Um, oh look, I would I would say <clears throat> amazing to be honest. Um, and, and I don't want to make this sound all like, you know, cover over things. There's been some really difficult times in the house. I think we, there's a lot of stress at times in the house. Probably things have got a little bit easier recently. Moving into a bigger place has, has kind of helped because we're not as on top of each other. But you can imagine we, my wife and I are dealing with a lot of kind of trauma and stuff and mm. then you're trying to work and you've got the stress of that and just the stress of general parent life. So there's been some times where it's like a pressure cooker in our house, mm. right? And I, it's like, I know, and I, I know I'm like, God, I'm, you know, I'm not dealing with things really well, but it's like, I'm so, the pressure is so much from so many different angles that, um, yeah, there's times where it's been really challenging, but I think generally, um, especially recently, as we, we're getting more used to, to normal life and, and whatnot, I think, you know, the relationship is great. You know, I've, I always have spent, I've worked very flexibly since my son was born. Um, so I've always spent um, a lot of time with him. And I think as he's getting a bit older, not that we'll ever talk about the severity mm. of what he's going through, but I think he sort of, he understands more that, you know, we're, everything we're doing, we're trying to help him. Mm. Um, I'm always there, I'm, you know, take him to all his hospital appointments. You know, the other week he got ill, I'm straight in, let's go, um, stay with him for a few days. You know, I, you know we're, I'm at all his sports things. We spend so much time together um, and I think now, the contrast of the time we're spending together is is now more like fun mm. versus hospital treatment mm. etc yeah. i think you know i'm certainly feeling that it's um 
it's a lot more enjoyable. And as I say, I think more recently, I found myself feeling less stressed and um, better in a better headspace to be a better parent. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'd, look, I'd say the, the, the relationship's great. We, you know, we're a really close-knit family, but something like this does, you know, I'd be lying if I said there aren't times where it's really quite challenging of for us as a family. And like I said before, where, you know, you're trying to pick, you know, each other up. If I'm down and, and Danny's up, you know, she'll try bring me up and vice versa. But there are times where we're both down here. Yeah. And then that's when things get difficult. Of and course. that's when, you know, the, the um, like I say, the temperature in the house can be high. It can be a bit of a pressure cooker. Of but course. You know, and, and, we're all and, just try, we're just trying to work it out as we go, right? Yeah, of course. And and what was it? Was there anything? Obviously, in the early days, everything's just you know wild. But a, yeah. Yeah, as that time progressed, you said it's been eighteen months. Was there any strategies that you had to implement in your life to create that space? To create that, I guess that the the, the release valve on that pressure cooker, as you said, uh, for you personally to bring down those stress levels. Yeah, to, honestly, it was it was almost an accidental thing um, when I look back so fortunately for, for myself um, <clears throat> I was so when the like intensive part of treatment ended everyone kept saying to us like just be very careful right so that's like seven to eight months mm. of the two-year treatment is this you know the really intensive stuff and they're like just be careful when you come out of this because you go from it being like every day, you're, the hospital's like a second home and then suddenly you're at home mm -hmm. and it's just a very different pace. I was like, it's gonna be the best thing ever. We're gonna be over this horrendous part, it's gonna be a massive milestone. And they were so correct. It was like both of us mentally really struggled um, when we came out. It's like everything that just hit you again. You've been in fight mode for so long and then all the adrenaline starts to wear off and you're just left with your thoughts. And um, it was a really challenging time. And, and I actually, um, the hospital asked Jacob, they're attached to another research institute. They asked Jacob to be um, an ambassador for one of their fundraising events. And it was a cycling event. And I was like, well, if he's gonna be an ambassador, I need to do this. So I like got myself, you know, a, a bike, started you know had like a few days before this month-long challenge on the bike um and i honestly i was having i'd lost i have i've been the same weight for about 18 years i'd lost about eight or nine kilos i was having all kinds of stomach pains wow. issues within about a week of cycling i felt amazing wow. I'd never cycled before got into this thing almost completely by chance um and it changed my, honestly changed my life. Wow. I met all these incredible people. We spoke about um, you know the Tour de Cure thing. This group of people that that raise money um, for for cancer research. They're incredibly supportive. I started to ride with all these different people from that group. Um, and the sort of early mornings, the physical challenge, seeing the sunrise, mm. all of that stuff. Um, became like my therapy mm -hmm. and it's I basically now and I'm and, and an avid cyclist I'm a, just crossed over like the year mark of cycling and it combines so many things in terms of it's my release mm. I, I need mm. it you know I, I do at least three times a week um, with a great group um, a group that I can talk to about things mm. Um, and generally we're training for some kind of fundraiser all mm. the time as well. So the sort of purpose yes. attached to it. So as I say, it was by complete chance that that arose, but I'm so grateful to have it because I, I wonder where my headspace would be without it. Amazing. Mm. And, and, and I, I hear you say cycling, but also the way I break that down is it, it's not just that one thing. It's like those things you just touched mm. on. It's being outdoors yeah. and seeing that natural light each day. It's having space and time to have your thoughts and, and process. It's having people around you to be able to talk and to be able to yeah. talk out things and, and hear different perspectives. It's exercise to 
you know, for your body and then ultimately you have to fuel your body post that. Yeah. And it's all those things combined that's created that. And that, yeah. that's incredible. That's, a, that's yeah. really amazing. To, to, you touched on earlier, and I guess now we'll, we'll start to shift into, I guess, this, this shift in you, which was to move into this ambassadorship. But you touched on something that I, wanna, I would love to kind of unpack a little bit, which was around the way I saw, I guess, the, the light and the twinkle in your eye when you talked about those, the doctors and the nurses around you. Yeah. What was the biggest impact that they had in your life, obviously above and beyond, you know, getting Jacob to where he is today, like but from that emotional connection that, you, that is creating that. Yeah, feeling. honestly, it's like, I, I feel so bad for not appreciating doctors, nurses, and it's not just that, it's, it's support staff mm. as well. Um, I, when you are in a situation that potentially is life or death with, with your child and, um, you see these people you've never met before, never you know, knew kind of, not, not knew existed, but you had no perspective on what they really did. Um, and suddenly they're there just saving your son's life and, and supporting both your son and, and, your, and us as a family through it. It's hard to put into perspective the gratitude you feel. Um, some of the nurses there are just some of the most incredible, amazing people, like the care they provide to, as much to the kids as, as to us is, is incredible. And there's a few that just stick out that, you know, I can remember a moment where we had Jacob had fallen really sick, like worryingly sick. And I had to rush him to hospital late at night. You go straight into emergency if it's like, um, out of hours, you get fast tracked through, you're in a room, they hook him up to antibiotics, fluids really quickly, and it's, it's like really mm. quite um, really stressful. And it was like we eventually get moved to a room at like one o'clock in the morning or something, and we came through upstairs, and two of the nurses on duty were two of our, the nurses were like closest with um, a girl called Talia and a girl called Maddie. And honestly, I just like, tears coming down my eyes. They were just there waiting for us. They knew we were coming. They'd completely made the room up, my bed, everything. Wow. And just that feeling of like, I don't know, that connection we had with them and that you're going through hell. And just, it almost like I just relaxed as soon as I came in, as soon as I saw them. And it's like, that's an, a really special mm. impact to have. If I think about Luch, um, as I said, the head of oncology, children's oncology at Westmead, um, oh, I like, I struggle to talk about him without getting emotional, but <laughs> he's just like, honestly, this guy has just dedicated his whole life to, to saving children. Um, he's the loveliest man you'll ever meet, honestly. And he goes above and beyond. Um, for families calling us late at night, messaging us late at night. There's never anything he won't organize or do for us. And again, when you talk about how I felt when I saw these nurses at that time, sitting in the, you know, in the, um, the oncology clinic, it's like, it's a weird place. It's such a contrast because you're sat there with all these kids facing life-threatening diseases, but it's also a really positive place. Most of those kids now get better. The staff are amazing, but sometimes it's pretty tense in there and families are going through things and Luch walks out, calls a family name, and it's like the kid, the parents, like this light that comes when he comes out and calls their name. And I'm like, what an impact to mm -hmm. have. That, and I know that might sound like a small thing, but when you are literally going through hell and just someone walking out, calling your name to bring you through and that just changes your mood instantly. Wow. I think it's just testament to, to the man that he is and he's done so much for us. And, and when you think about impact, think about the network effect of, mm. of what he's done over the, whatever it's been, 30, 40 years of his career, the number of lives that have been saved and then those people have gone on to have kids yeah. and some of those people might, might even be grandparents now mm. from all the years ago like multiply that up and mm. think of the impact he's had. And you know, he, he consults with 
hospitals and research centers around the world and, and so his impact is, is a global impact. And then there's, there's people like, you know, child life, in, there's a child life therapy team, which is something I never knew existed, right? And they are literally there. So imagine Jacob's got to have something done to him mm. and he's got to be awake. Um, stressful, right? Mm. And it's as hard as a parent as well. Like, and again, the kids will push back against you because yeah, you're yeah. close. So their role is to come in and to just help the kids through it. And uh, our child life therapist was a girl called Georgia. And honestly, I just, we owe so much to her. She is, it's one of those where you're like, this, this girl should be paid an absolute fortune because of the impact she has and, and what she does. Um, and as a, again, one of those where she's as much a support to mm. the child as she is to us. Mm. And again, I talk, you know, I've used this example about the nurses, about um, Luch, our doctor, when like the temperature is, is pretty high in the room because there's a procedure about to happen or something's going and, and, you know, he's getting stressed, we're getting stressed and they beep her, she turns up and the whole room just goes, mm -hmm. she comes in, Jacob smiles, yeah. you know, and, and she works him through it and just gets him through whatever he needs to get through. And it's like, these are just, they're such unsung heroes. Um, and you, you can't spend time around these people and not come out and want to be a better person. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's the impact they, they've had on me. I'm just so full of gratitude and my eyes have been opened to, to this world that, as I mentioned before, I had no idea about. Um, and I think that's what drives me to, to go out and, and try and do what I can to help because um, how can I not when I've seen what these people have done mm. for, for Jacob and, and for my family? And, and talk about the network, network effect, right? Is that the impact yeah. and the way they touch your life, you're now have made a dedication and ultimately steps, many steps to, to make impact through fundraising, through the ambassadorship. And so I guess let's go there. So, so, so we hear the driver. Yeah. When did it start and, and what does it look like? Yes, it's really interesting because at, at first, like, um, you're just like in, you know, deep into it. And I felt this overwhelming, very early on, I felt this overwhelming kind of gratitude and wanting to do something. And, and my first kind of foray into doing something was actually after Jacob's first blood transfusion. And it's still like, at that moment is one of those that I'm, I can just transport back to because when they said to me that he had to have a blood transfusion, and this is right after his diagnosis, blew my mind, mm. four-year-old blood transfusion. I think I'd always kind of thought about blood transfusions that, you know, someone's been in a car crash, they've lost a lot of blood, mm -hmm. right? Never had any sort of realization of how much blood is used in the treatment mm. of, well, I mean, it makes sense now, blood cancers, mm. right? Mm. Um, I can remember sitting there and it was really confronting. This bag of blood gets brought in he gets hooked up to the machine and I'm sort of watching it go in. And at the start, I was like, this is awful. Mm. And then very quickly, again, when you talk about how the mind shift and again, not a deliberate thing, but I was suddenly like, God, that someone who I don't know mm -hmm. has like off their own back, gone out, donated blood mm. and their blood is now going into my son to help save his life. Incredible. And I was, I can remember just thinking, I wish there was like a, mobile phone, yeah. you know, a name and a number. And I could just send them a message and go, by the way, you went in and donated this blood. Well, look, here's the impacts that you're mm. having. Um, so from that moment, I was like, I was aware that um, Brits can donate blood um, because of this crazy mad cow disease rule, right? right. Like if you were born in the UK during this period of mad cow disease, um, you weren't allowed to donate right. blood. So I was just like, you know, there's a lot of spare time in the hospital. <laughs> so I was like, you know, I had a bee in my bonnet about this. So I was like, right, just reaching out to anyone and, and everyone about this going, look, this is a situation. I hate the fact I can't donate blood. Yeah. Sent off about a thousand messages. And 
eventually people started coming back to me and I had all these conversations. And when you talk about, I don't know, almost like fate and timing, the process had started to unravel this mm. to allow Brits to wow. donate blood. So I was keeping in touch with them. Eventually it got announced it was going to happen. And I, um, I honestly, LinkedIn is so bloody good, right? <laughs> so I've like found the chief marketing officer at, um, at Lifeblood on LinkedIn. I've sent her a message and gone, look, I've been keeping in touch with people behind the scenes. I've heard this is, this is now going to go through, that this is going to be changed. I don't think there's probably a better story in Australia right now than ours wow. to like, yeah. um, to use um, for this scenario. And then I just laid out what had happened, you know, Brits mm -hmm. living in Australia on the receiving end of blood to help save our son's life. And she literally, I woke up the next morning to a message. She's like, I'd love to have a chat. And so that was the sort of, that was over, you know, started week like four or five. And then this was now like, around the eight month mark this oh, wow. all kind of came to fruition but this was the first bit and then we became one of the main stories in that campaign wow. i was one of the first people to donate blood um, as a brit after this um this change under um you know live on tv doing interviews and everything and it was my it was my first what felt like my first moment to give back mm. and it felt really good. I was like, you know, I can remember saying like, I know where these blood bags end up. Mm. So the thought of that and being able to do it was really, really special. And That's awesome. you know, that, that I knew I wanted to do more. And again, with, it was sort of with the Children's Cancer Institute, it was, well, I'm not gonna say accidental, but I wasn't as aware of them because we're at Westmead and, and they're on site at Ramwick. Mm. And again, you talk about fate, a very good friend of mine who's been a huge support to me, um, introduced me to someone who was an ambassador for one of their fundraising mm -hmm. events, a girl called Sarah, um, amazing girl. And we caught up for a coffee. And she's like, look, we get a table at the Children's Cancer Institute Diamond Ball mm -hmm. every year. Mm -hmm. It's their big fundraiser. Um, I'd love you to come along. So I was, honestly, this is, um, when I say I'm like a broken man, we've just come out of this eight, nine months. Mm. I've lost all this weight. I'm gaunt in the face. I've still got my shaved head. Mm. Like I look like a prisoner of war or something. <laughs> and I was like, I'm in an R in, should I do this? And then literally almost like last minute, I was like, I'm going to go. Mm. I'm going to get a tux. I'm going to go along to this event. Sort of no expectations really. Um, anyway, went to this the diamond ball and I was just blown away honestly this event is just incredible and it's like the who's who are there really? I remember walking in um, and the first thing I see is like some bid by um, is it Lionel Lee from Bingley family yeah. for like 50 grand on something and I'm like oh wow this is this is serious um, so we on the table and this event is just so glamorous and there's so much goodwill in the room and then Michelle Haber who is like the person who leads the cancer the Children's Cancer Institute stood up on stage and gave her sort of um, opening talk and I was just transfixed wow. I was like who is this woman and I can remember writing her name down in my phone um, just where I talk about Luch um, our doctor on sort of the oncology side she's like the looch of research yeah. right been in it for years and she, i just was hooked on every word she said and believed every word she said and believe when she says that it you know in terms of finding cures it's not if it's when it's mm. kind of their tagline and i believed her and i was so inspired by her that i went home after I got over a bit of a hangover, first time I'd yeah. drunk in a long time at that event. Um, and I sent her uh, an email and I was like, look, I was at the event. This is my background. Um, I was so inspired. I just want to say, like, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, she replied within like a day. Wow. I was like, look, whenever you're ready, let me know mm. and come in and I'll show you around the, show you around. So about a month later, I felt ready. Sure enough, sent a message and, and um, she took me on a, a tour around the, the Children's Cancer Institute. 
and that just I was just hooked. Mm. It's just what they are doing and, and the progress they're making is is absolutely unbelievable. The team there is incredible. Um, and from that moment, I was like, what can I do to, to get involved? Where do I start? And it started with, you know, sort of, well, let's let's get your story mm -hmm. um, down and, and then we can share that as part, you know, on the website and through social channels. So I went through that process. Um, and then, you know, there was a few little things of we were the uh, like ambassador family for one of their fundraising events, the Balmoral Swim, which again was the kids loved it. It was a lot of fun, a little bit of a TV appearance. Um, and then in a, again, a really weird coincidence, um, uh, a lady called Faye, who's an absolute legend, um, her daughter had been diagnosed about 18 months before Jacob. And we kind of met through LinkedIn. Wow. I'd seen some stuff she was sharing. Um, I'd messaged them, um, I guess we'd become almost like pen pals on, yeah. on LinkedIn um, with this kind of shared story. She took on the role of family liaison officer at Children's Cancer Institute. Mm. So we had this relationship, she's then taken on this role and we, even though we hadn't known each other that long, I think just we're very similar in personality and such a shared connection that it felt like we'd known each other forever. So I'm like, Faye, just anything you need anything, mm. I'll do it. Mm. And I was like, if it's an hour's notice, 24 hours notice, I'll do it. I've got you know, quite a lot of flexibility with work. And because we have that relationship, she's you know, felt comfortable to ask me. And she's still always very much, look, I just wanna make sure you're okay. And blah, blah. I'm like, Faye, I've told you, I'll do whatever. <laughs> so that's been great because then there's been a lot more opportunity to um, speak at a number of events, um, to get involved. We're the ambassador family for the CEO Dare to Cure event that they're doing this year, um, which has been a few TV appearances, which Jacob has absolutely loved. Oh, good. And so it's great because, I don't know, it's like you get to do all these things, raise awareness, have an impact, but they're very good at making sure that the families are involved and they, there's things that are fun for the kids as well. Awesome. Just so aligned with them as an organization and what they're doing and, and seeing firsthand how much progress they're making that, you know, this for me now is like, it's a lifelong thing of what can I do to support them? And I know that that will change over time, you know? Our story is very current, mm -hmm. so, you know, there's a lot of talk about our story and stuff, but that will change soon. And, and, you know, other families will come through with the current story. And so then it's like, what else can we do in the background? And then you look at how you can utilize your network to do various things. So, um, and when I talk about before having that purpose, like, I feel like my life is better for having this purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and whilst it's strange, because whilst I wish this had never happened, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, having this purpose um, brings a really positive um, thing to my life that, that I didn't have before. Amazing. Matt, I have one last question for you. Okay. And my question is, looking back at the last 18 months, what are you most proud of? Um, oh, it's a good question. Um, Look, I mean, I'm so proud of Jacob for getting through this um, and for sort of coming out the other side and seemingly just being the happiest kid who loves school, um, loves his mates. And, and maybe without even realizing it, I think there's like this, he's got this gratitude for the simple things because of that period in hospital where he didn't get to do them. And I think that's maybe subconscious with him. Um, so I know you said one thing, but yeah. then I, I just think in general, uh, like as a family, it has been a really challenging time. And the, you know, the fact that we are still just about in one piece and haven't you know, had complete nervous breakdowns and um, you know, even managed la, you know, this year to move out, you know, buy a, um, a house upgrade, which was, you know, add a lot of stress on top of stress, but we did it. It's been a, ma a big thing for us. And I think we've, we're just setting ourselves up for the next stage of our life, having gone through something really difficult. And, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of the family for, um, for, for being able to do that. Amazing. Well, well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, what you're doing is truly inspiring. You know, I, I have, I am, like 
I can't even express in words like um, the impact that you're creating, the the ability that you're going out in there and sharing your story. Um, and I think you know myself not having gone through this, but to the families who have, I think there's there's probably not enough thanks in the world for for doing what you do. So Matt. Thank you so much for, for being here with me today. Thanks, mate, and thanks for letting me share my story on your uh, uh, through your network. Um, I really appreciate it.